We live in a time in which centuries of injustice have de delivered us a moment of national crisis. But that crisis is not in and of itself bad. We are called to radical change because that change is necessary if we are to survive as one nation, as one city. I believe that to be true. But I also believe that the violent behavior of a selfish few last night was not designed to move our nation toward greater equality. These were not selfless acts of courageous change. There is no just cause that is furthered by pulling a gun and shooting an individual in the middle of our downtown streets. There is no just cause that is furthered by destroying the livelihoods of thousands of families, including black families, who will now find themselves without work due to businesses closed by these violent acts. These were selfish acts of people who did not give one moment's thought as to how their violence might harm the cause of progress that was championed by peaceful protesters yesterday afternoon. But let there be no doubt, I was heartened to see thousands of people come together over the course of an afternoon to exercise their constitutional right to free expression. The event organizers, they coordinated with the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department. And in so doing, we were able to provide a safe, organized opportunity for activism, for community conversation about issues that cut to the very core of who we are as a city, who we are as a country. To each and every person who participated in those peaceful protests, I offer you my genuine thanks. We may not agree on every issue, but I do believe your efforts yesterday were intended to make our city better, to make our city a more just place to call home. As the day ended, those protests concluded peacefully. It was repeatedly suggested that attendees return home safely and in the knowledge that their message of change had been delivered with power and with eloquence. If that had been the end of the story, I am confident that our city would have been better for it. Unfortunately, that is not what happened. What occurred instead was a tragedy. Rocks and other projectiles were thrown, businesses were vandalized and looted, government buildings were targeted, fires were repeatedly set with the intention of doing harm. Guns were pulled and deadly violence was directed with wanton disregard for other civilians. In the chaos that ensued, significant damage was done to our downtown. Once more, we awake to a morning defined by unproductive destruction instead of the meaningful dialogue our city requires if we are to become the change that justice demands. I want to be abundantly clear. The damage done last night was in spite of heroic efforts of our law enforcement and public safety partners who desperately attempted to preserve 
the safe opportunity for protest on behalf of our residents. And just as importantly, the damage done last night was in spite of the good faith acts of many downtowns who were attempting to give voice to their cause and in so doing undertook simple but equally heroic acts of civic love. They tried to protect businesses. They put out fires. They worked to help those caught up in this senseless violence to safely return home. Indianapolis, city government, and your police department will continue to do all we can to provide safe passage for messages of peaceful protest. But it is clear after last night that we can no longer provide the protection of those protesters or our downtown residents and business owners when an unfortunate few are so determined to hijack this movement for their own selfish reasons, for their own selfish purposes. That is why this morning I will sign an executive order instituting a countywide curfew and red travel warnings that will take effect at 8 p.m. this evening and last through 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. Under this order, all residents are required to be home by 8 p.m. and to stay home for their own safety. Of course, exceptions will be permitted for those traveling directly to and from their place of work or for essential medical care for individuals or their close family members. In addition, the order will permit the travel of public safety personnel, essential government activities, and the journalism that our city needs now more than ever. Law enforcement across the county will be prepared to enforce these orders and individuals found in violation will be subject to arrest and fines of up to $10,000. This policy is not intended to punish our residents. It is intended to protect them. And we also remain committed to protecting the peaceful demonstrations that we fully expect will take place today, this afternoon. And in the weeks to come, we do not tolerate these acts of protest. We celebrate these acts of protest. And just as with yesterday, we will continue to work with event organizers to ensure they have a venue to deliver their nonviolent message without interference. But we ask that any organization responsible for such demonstrations be clear in their request that all participating individuals make their way safely home by 8 p.m. this evening. These actions are necessary, but they break my heart. They break my heart because I know that by taking these necessary steps, we are perpetuating a narrative that places the violent acts of last night on a pedestal, diminishing the power of activism that has understandably been sparked by the visceral reminders of injustice our nation has experienced in recent weeks. To those activists, to our community as a whole, to our African-American residents, 
I cannot begin to fathom your anguish. And I will never in my life possess one moment of experience that captures the essence of the black experience in America. But I see you and I hear you. Looting, rioting, violence against others, that is not who we are as a city. It has never been who we are as a city. And just as our voices rise in anger at violence and injustice perpetuated against communities of color, we must also condemn, strongly condemn, the senseless acts of those who would seek to rip apart Indianapolis at its seams. But please, please, I implore you, do not let our condemnation of those violent acts dissuade you from peaceful action. Last night showed we need that action now more than ever. I challenge Indianapolis to organize. I encourage Indianapolis to lawfully demonstrate. As Representative John Lewis said yesterday, now is the time to sit in and stand up, to be constructive, not destructive. If you haven't already, go out and vote today at an early vote center. Like those who rushed to stamp out the riotous flames that burned downtown last night, so too must Indianapolis resolve to extinguish acts of hate and embrace the radical nonviolent love that has always proven to be a vehicle for progress in our country. If we do these things, and if we do them together as one city, we can emerge from this tragedy stronger than ever before. And it is my prayer on this Sunday of Pentecost, it is my prayer that those things which bind us together, our common humanity, our civic pride will permit us to acknowledge and then address those things that have divided us for far too long. That is my prayer. To provide an update on last night's violence, I now turn it over to Chief Randall Taylor of the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department. Chief. Good morning. Last night, a large peaceful protest developed into violence. We saw businesses damaged, civilians injured, an IMPD officer injured, and two individuals lose their lives. We arrested 29 individuals. We're still gathering information to understand the full scope of property damage and resident injuries. For two days, I've listened to the message peaceful protesters, advocating for change in our city and our country. Like so many, and as a black man in America, I share many of their frustrations and agree with much of what they are advocating for. But I believe that there is nothing about the riots we experienced last night in Indianapolis that helped the cause of the protesters we continue to support and protect. And I specifically don't believe there's a single thing about young people shooting each other in our downtown streets that does a single thing to advance the cause of justice. My prayer is for peace for this city. My prayer is for all those who are frustrated and concerned with the direction of the things that are happening across the country. My prayer is for all the men and women of the IMPD, both sworn and civil. But I, I challenge you with this. We're all accountable for our individual actions. 
And that requires us to consider more than our own lives, but the far reaching impact our actions have on the lives of others. For those suggesting our officers are out looking for a fight, let me be clear. That is not the case. Our officers work throughout the day on Saturday to give protesters a safe platform to have their voices heard and took action only when public safety was jeopardized. And consider this. As shootings took place across downtown last <clears throat> night, not a single officer discharged a firearm. Obviously, the night was very chaotic, but I am proud the restraint our officers showed last night. I implore the residents of this city that I love to take this into account before senseless violence takes another life in the sake of seeking justice for others. Further comment, I'll introduce Deputy Chief Josh Parker. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chief. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I've been given an opportunity to very briefly give a rundown um, of a timeline and some of the events that transpired <clears throat> yesterday afternoon, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and into the evening and overnight. Uh, as the Chief and the Mayor alluded to, uh, very early yesterday, we had an opportunity to sit down with community leaders and um, protest organizers. Um, that was a very proactive and engaging discussion that we had with both sides. Uh, and it, we, we walked away from that meeting with a mutual agreement and understanding um, of the assistance we were requesting from one another. Uh, pursuant to that meeting, the initial, um, the initial protests uh, began very well. Um, and as I had mentioned before in previous remarks, uh, before things took a turn uh, later in the evening, which I will get to, um, yesterday's protest uh, is one of the most positive experiences that we have uh, been able to take a part of as a police department in Indianapolis. Um, you essentially, uh, you had two groups in two locations that consisted of um, several hundred people. IMPD's posture from the very beginning, uh, subsequent to that mutual agreement, was uh, we were going to be in the area to provide any necessary assistance uh, and be able to immediately respond um, to any calls for help from the group. However, our proactive posture at that point um, was to remain out of the area uh, and assist those visitors with intersection control and traffic blocking. Uh, that went off very successfully. We were able to um, block streets in a manner that allowed uh, vehicular and pedestrian traffic to continue to flow freely through downtown while still giving protesters ample uh, room and opportunity um, to peaceably demonstrate. Um, those groups um, took an opportunity and we supported their movement throughout the downtown area. Uh, and that um, those events took place for several hours. I think it's also important to note though, um, while we were providing that traffic direction, uh, we were also doing our due diligence and the officers on scene were doing what was asked of them. And that was to continue to make observations and ensure that there were no bad actors hiding amongst the peaceful protesters. Um, that as we have seen over the past couple of days, uh, have ulterior motives in those gatherings and oftentimes are looking for opportunities uh, to quickly aggravate those crowds um, and take a peaceful protest into a violent riot. Um, throughout the course of the day, we did observe um, such behavior. Uh, there was a great deal of foot traffic on the periphery of those gatherings. Um, we observed individuals loading rocks uh, and other objects into backpacks. Um, there were individuals who were carrying um, shields and other implements to protect themselves from any, um, any law enforcement tactics that we may have to employ. Uh, there was medical supplies. Um, there, were, there were bottles of milk being passed out. Uh, the context of that is uh, some of those medical supplies and milk, those are measures that individuals take uh, to try to counteract the effects of chemical agents that law enforcement uses to disperse uh, large riotous groups. In addition to those implements, we observed uh, 
an unsettling number of individuals armed with various types of uh, long guns, shotguns, handguns, and the like. Because of the superb organization uh, of the protest leaders, uh, we were able to ob um, observe those events transpire peacefully and continue to follow those groups as they move throughout the city. Um, after several hours, um, the large group of approximately five to 600 people separated into smaller groups um, of approximately two to 300 people. Uh, our officers were able to split up with those groups and continue to block traffic and observe behavior. One group uh, made their way towards the city county building and ultimately congregated on the Market Street entrance between the city market and the Market Street entrance of the city county building. It was at that point uh, that we noticed a turn from a protester crowd to a gathering of individuals who were making overt actions to ramp up their efforts to disturb the protest. Uh, and what I mean by that specifically is law enforcement started observing folks in the crowd, um, donning eye protection, uh, face protection. Uh, we started seeing some of those implements uh, coming out of backpacks, frozen water bottles, rocks. And instead of um, remaining peaceful in the group uh, and expressing themselves, uh, individuals uh, parked a vehicle at one end of Market Street and utilized uh, amber colored lights in that vehicle to block traffic. That was a, not a law enforcement vehicle. And then other individuals joined arms to create a daisy chain on the other end of Market Street, uh, in effect, trying to disrupt any potential ingress for law enforcement to come in and take action should things take a turn. Um, those tensions continued to build, and then we had a group of individuals very quickly advance uh, onto the front of the city county building on the Market Street entrance. Um, it started with things being thrown at the windows uh, and moved from there to people banging and kicking on the windows. Um, at this point, I think it's important to understand, IMPD was still not advanced onto that group of individuals. Uh, we were approximately a block to a block and a half away, still observing a large contingent of that 200 person group that was still peacefully protesting. Uh, but as their acts continued to increase in aggression, that is when our officers started to move towards that group and have discussions about increasing our posture. When the banging and the rock throwing began on the windows, um, sheriff's deputies with the Marion County Sheriff's Office were stationed inside of the building to ensure that if it were breached, there would still be security inside. At one point, an individual was successful in um, kicking out and breaking a window on the Market Street side of the city county building. At that point, uh, in communications with the Marion County Sheriff's Office, uh, they requested assistance for IMPD to move in immediately, which we did. It still took us some time to get our officers into the area of Market Street. And our intention in the very beginning was to create a buffer or an area of deniability, if you will, to get those rioters back away from the building to prevent uh, additional damage to the city county building and keep them from entering that building with an overwhelming number of people. Again, it's important to note this peaceful protest at this point turned from protest to riot based on the activities and decisions made by a very violent and aggressive few that splintered off of that peaceful group and made the decision um, to, to do that attack on the city county building. Uh, in a matter of minutes, our officers were able to successfully get into Market Street on foot. Um, they immediately started getting rocks thrown at them. Um, Rioters in the crowd had firecrackers and other incendiary type devices that they were lighting on fire and throwing at our officers. Um, they then began to damage some of the police vehicles that had pulled up in the periphery. Uh, it was not until that point, uh, several hours into this successful protest, that IMPD initially used pepper ball and chemical agents to start to disperse that riotous crowd that had gathered in front of the city county. Um, 
We made some initial arrests on scene based on individuals we identified engaged in illegal activity. Um, it was a, a handful or so of people that were initially arrested on Market Street. Um, one of the things that continued to aggravate that situation is as officers moved in to take those individuals in custody, the remaining rioters uh, completely and very quickly encircled those officers, uh, which made it very difficult for us to get additional resources and to support those arrests. Uh, chemical agents and pepper ball uh, continued to be used until we were able to successfully and safely get that crowd back, uh, which we ultimately were able to do. Uh, thankfully, no officers uh, and thankfully no rioters who were taken into custody were injured at that point. Um, however, it was at that time in the evening that things turned from peaceful protest um, to violent riotous activity that carried on into the early morning hours. Um, over the course of the evening, uh, it, it, it unfortunately culminated in two homicides several non-fatal shootings downtown. Um, as the chief alluded to, we are still working with business owners and property managers to get accurate numbers um, on levels of vandalism that occurred. However, I can tell you is extremely extensive. Uh, and we've been helping um, provide security to DPW folks as they've uh, been working to clean that up all morning. Our primary mission remained responding to and I say responding to, not chasing after, but we were responding to um, calls for criminal activity in progress. Um, there were several people, even within that riotous crowd, um, that were bystanders. We recognized that, uh, and our department remained very professional. I'm very proud of the work they did. There were individuals that were caught in the middle, and I think I get the sense that they did not expect that level of violence to increase as quickly as it did. We maintained our focus on the specific individuals who were breaking property, discharging firearms, driving recklessly, uh, and other activities that were putting our citizens and residents in the downtown area in harm's way. Uh, we responded to numerous calls for looting, vandalism, uh, and uh, quite a number of fires that were being set in the downtown area. Uh, one of our secondary uh, responsibilities was to provide security protection for our fire and EMS personnel as they responded to numerous persons injured and fires throughout the downtown area. It was very difficult uh, and very understandable that those resources in several instances were not able to respond in as timely a manner as we are used to simply because we were unable to initially restore order uh, in those areas where those incidents were occurring. Um, and unfortunately, we did have some, uh, although few instances, of our EMS crews and firefighters uh, getting objects thrown at them as well. Uh, we were able to work um, with some additional resources called into the downtown area um, approximately 2 o'clock in the morning to um, do a downtown mile square shift in the traffic pattern. Um, we had some very uh, quick success with that and helping get some of the vehicular traffic out of the downtown square, which allowed us to free up officers um, to put them at stationary locations on intersections, thus allowing some of our event response group members to start um, moving along with these uh, small groups of riotous individuals who continued to damage property and the like. Um, Things finally quieted down and we were able to successfully uh, restore order to a level of comfort at approximately four o'clock this morning. Um, and then that is when we started to pull our officers back and either return them to normal patrol duties uh, or send them home for the evening. Um, that is the update as far as uh, the operational tempo from the overnight. Um, I would now like to um, Welcome to Juan Garrett from the Greater Indianapolis branch of the NAACP to the podium for remarks. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Mayor Hogsett, Chief Taylor, Deputy Mayor. I stand here as representative of one of the oldest civil rights organizations, the NAACP. As I sat here this morning, I'm thankful for the, the beautiful day that we have. I'm also a little disheartened 
by some of the actions that I saw within the last couple of years. Within our organization, we're always advocates for peaceful protests. I commend those individuals that were out last night and engaged in a peaceful action of showing solidarity with the Minneapolis community, as well as to respect the wishes of the family members of Mr. Floyd. Those individuals should be commended for their actions. But I also stand here to condemn those individuals that came out with intent in their heart to cause damage. We believe strongly in your right to peacefully protest. There's nothing within the Constitution enshrined that says that you have a right to commit crime and vandalism. That is nothing that provides any, any form or fashion to, to, to push your agenda forward of having positive change. We would hope that members of the community would take this moment to step back and reflect. Reflect on some of what the good that's being done. We, we understand totally that there are certain individuals within the police department that it may be bad apples. We also know that the overwhelming majority of those police officers are there to do their job, serve the community, and make sure that we all are protected. But again, in these unnormal times, we fully expect people to adhere to the basic commonality and principles of doing what's right. And doing what's right is to peacefully protest, not to engage in vandalism and violence. That is something that I cannot rightfully stand here as an organization to support. So I ask the community, those that individuals that are engaging in peaceful activity to continue engaging in peaceful activity. But those individuals that intend to not engage in a peaceful action, stay away. You're not helping this cause. You're not honoring the memory of Mr. Floyd, nor are you showing solidarity with our community, nor the Minneapolis community. I'm now turning the floor back over to the mayor and the chief. Thank you. As usual, we will call upon people who have entered their name and outlet into the Q&A box. Our first one is Ebony Chappelle from Radio One. Ebony? We'll come back to Ebony. Uh, our next question is from Russ McQuaid at Fox 59. And good morning, Mr. Mayor. Russ. I've been out on the streets for about 36 straight hours, Your Honor. And a question I hear a lot of people ask me is they say, well, where's the mayor? Sir, have you walked the streets? Who have you talked to? What have you seen? And since I recognize you're in your conference room right now, I've got a photographer downtown. Can I meet you? in the lobby of the city county building at 12 30 and go on a walk with you through downtown indianapolis this afternoon you know russ i have uh, uh surveyed much of the damage uh as you point out uh, i've been coming into the office uh over the last couple of days um you know i would welcome the opportunity uh to walk with you russ but for the fact that uh right now uh, both DPW and IMPD are working very diligently uh, to um, uh, restore and repair the damages that have been perpetrated on the businesses in the downtown area. Uh, and I really don't want to do anything that slows that progress down. Um, and, and frankly, I would encourage all residents of our city uh, to not take uh, their beautiful uh, Sunday afternoon uh, by walking around downtown, taking, uh, taking their time assessing damages. And I'm going to hold myself to that same standard. Uh, so uh, I appreciate your uh, offer, uh, but I think uh, the DPW workers and IMPD are better served. The fewer people that are populating the downtown area, 
while they are restoring our businesses uh, back to safety. Scott Sander, Wish TV. Mayor, thank you. Uh, given the gift of uh, hindsight, which is uh, which is easy to say at this point, um, did you consider a curfew before last night? Um, if so, why did you decide to decide against it? And has there been consideration uh, of uh, asking for help from the National Guard and or more from state police? Thank you. Uh, I don't see any immediate uh, need for a mass mobilization of the National Guard in Indianapolis. Um, it's our hope that through this curfew policy, uh, we will better equip our local and our state agencies uh, to respond to the challenges uh, if they occur. Uh, Scott, in answer to your uh, first question, uh, of course a curfew uh, is one uh, option uh, that we do not embrace uh, with any uh, celebration. Uh, but uh, I do believe uh, it has become necessary, and that's why I'll be signing the executive order today. The truth is that, uh, as I think both the chief and uh, deputy chief have indicated, uh, yesterday we engaged in the morning uh, with uh, many uh, groups uh, that have organized peaceful protests. Those conversations were uh, very productive. Uh, I want to make it clear, we don't necessarily agree on everything, uh, but we do agree on one thing, and that is um, that uh, peaceful protest is something that will help us change Indianapolis to make us a better city. Based on those conversations, uh, and based on, as you know, my admonishment that the protest uh, last from approximately four until seven o'clock last night. Uh, and I specifically requested all the protesters to understand uh, that uh, it would be good to uh, leave the city, the downtown area, and, and simply go home peacefully uh, after three to three and a half hours of uh, peaceful protest, maintaining uh, their cause and the uh, issues uh, that they are championing uh, as well as expressing their solidarity with uh, the city of Minneapolis uh, and cities, frankly, uh, throughout the country. Uh, that, as Deputy Chief Barker uh, just outlined in great detail, uh, was unfortunately breached by people who had, in my opinion, no intent to come and engage in peaceful protest. Um, and as a result, uh, the chaos and the destruction that uh, Deputy Chief Barker uh, identified ensued, and that is why uh, I have now taken the step uh, to impose a curfew from 8 p.m. tonight until 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. <coughs> Rafael Sanchez, WRTV. I have a question for the chief and the mayor. Uh, chief Taylor, there are reports that members of the extremist terrorist group Antifa uh, were in the crowd. Can you tell us anything about the uh, folks in the crowd that were from out of town? And Mr. Mayor, along those same lines, as the former U.S. attorney, do you see any signs of terror in the city? And since you mentioned Election Day, will you take any legal action to ensure that all absentee ballots are counted on Tuesday? A couple of questions. So, Go ahead, Chief. So as uh, obviously, I, I know that there were people uh, in the crowds that are not from uh, the Indianapolis area. Uh, I don't know if that particular group was involved. I would not be surprised if uh, that was confirmed. Uh, but we do know that there are people here uh, specifically to, to cause chaos and, and trouble. Uh, I think as we look through the reports of arrests, we'll probably find that uh, there's a number of people that did not live immediately in the Indianapolis area. I don't have those specific numbers uh, in front of me, but uh, again, would not be surprised to learn that. Yeah, Raphael, uh, as it relates to the questions that you directed uh, to me, uh, first, as a, a former United States attorney, there is one overwhelming lesson that I learned during the four years that I served, and that was to 
place a great deal of trust in law enforcement agencies, local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies, uh, to provide me with the uh, the intelligence uh, that I needed uh, to help lead the United States Attorney's Office in the prosecution of individuals uh, who uh, were violating the law in whatever manner. Uh, and so I trust the perspectives uh, offered uh, by uh, the chief and the deputy chief uh, of IMPD. Uh, as it relates to the election, uh, we will continue to monitor uh, the situation here in Marion County. Uh, as you appreciate, I know, Raphael, that uh, essentially uh, state elections, uh, which this primary uh, certainly qualifies, uh, are uh, primar primarily the state-related issues. Uh, but we're working cooperatively uh, with the Marion County Clerk's Office, uh, with the uh, Marion County Election Board, uh, to make sure that the election is conducted in a safe and efficient way. And uh, uh, we'll have more updates on that as we get closer to the election day itself. Justin Mack, Indy Star. Yes, good afternoon. And this question more for Chief and Deputy Chief. Uh, first, on the 29 arrests, uh, will there be a full list of the nature of those charges and the list of those arrested made available to us at some point today? If not, I'd like to request that and also for us to get a, a clear breakdown of who was local and who was from out of town. Is that something you think you'd be able to provide us today? The first question. And second, um, as far as what started the violence last night, I talked to some organizers who have taken issue with the description of a protest turned violent saying that from their perspective, where they were in the city, that uh, tear gas was levied unprovoked at the protesters. Do you know if maybe perhaps that assault you described on the CCB triggered officers to deploy tear gas in other parts of the city? Um, any response to people were saying it was unprovoked? So as for the list, uh, I believe we will be able to make that available. I'm not sure if that will be available by today, uh, but we'll do our best to try to accomplish that. As for the tear gas, uh, our officers deployed tear gas only after they felt or saw uh, issues that were putting uh, the public in jeopardy. Uh, so I, I would disagree with accounts of us just launching tear gas for no reason. I think uh, possible, um, uh, a possible insight into that would be that uh, you could be in one area and, and get the effects of the tear gas when officers are seeing something uh, maybe outside of your your scope of vision uh, that's going on. Tear gas, you know, is not a it's not a specifically targeted type of, uh, of, of instrument. Uh, it's going to flow, and people are going to be affected, even if they're not directly involved. So I would imagine that's certainly a, a possibility. Josh, you have any additional? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, I think it's important to note. I agree with that 100. Um, percent the, the initial location where we started to use chemical agents to disperse the crowd was in front of the city county building. And that was not an unprovoked use of chemical agents. That was, that was a specific law enforcement tactic employed in response to that initial group of rioters taking aggressive and violent action in front of the city county building, and they started to damage the property. It was not until property had been damaged that our officers even moved into the location. Chemical agents were used initially at the city county building. Um, but I think for some context, it's very important to understand. It's difficult to put into words and paint a picture of how rapidly things devolved and turned from peaceful gathering to riotous criminal mischief behavior. Um, we had multiple locations once there was an initial um, interaction in front of the city county building that triggered multiple locations of violent unrest to spin off almost simultaneously. Um, and as the media, uh, as we were all in the streets together, um, I think everybody can appreciate that it's very difficult for law enforcement to respond to the speed of information being shared on live streams, other social media platforms, and communication efforts that those those rioters who had predetermined that activity was going to take place were sharing with one another. Um, so yes, it was directed at the city county building and things quickly uh, evolved 
to the use of chemical weapons in multiple other locations. But that was only after violent behavior and property damage was observed by our officers and we responded, responded appropriately and used those weapons uh, and kept it, used the chemical agents rather um, as a tool to leverage against those crowds to get them to disperse so that we could start to get them under control in small pieces. Abdul Hakim Shabazz, Indy Politics. Chief, um, Mr. Mayor, my question for you is a little bit of clarification on uh, assistance to uh, some of the downtown businesses that were impacted by uh, the respective damages that they had. Uh, can they expect or should they expect any assistance from the city? Well, Abdul, uh, as we speak, uh, and I uh, answered to a previous question uh, from Russ, the way uh, DPW is providing materials, uh, DPW is providing personnel and labor uh, to businesses. But the recovery of the last two days uh, will take much more than that. So we intend to work with partners such as uh, Downtown Indy, such as the uh, Indy Chamber, to explore what kind of assistance uh, may be available and may be appropriate. Uh, but as we speak, DPW is doing everything it can to help downtown businesses recover from the damage done over the last two nights. Cameron Riddle, Radio One. Taylor, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Cameron. Um, good, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Chief. Uh, Deputy Chief uh, Barker a moment ago mentioned uh, protesters having uh, milk as a relief for pepper spray and the tear gas. And I say this as one of the many reporters who were tear gassed while on TV reporting. Are you saying that they can't have milk? Because I got a number of reports from protesters who said their supplies of milk and things that they had to be, <clears throat> excuse me, for relief. Um, were taken and confiscated by police. And then secondly, um, this morning on our WTLC radio show, uh, members of Black Lives Matter called in and uh, have asked people not to protest in downtown Indianapolis, um, but say there is going to be a week of action um, because they feel that um, their conversations are being misrepresented uh, by the mayor. So with that, uh, what is the city's plan if there are continued protests, maybe not tonight, but Monday night or Tuesday? You want to take the milk question first? Um, I, I can address the milk question. Um, I, I think obviously law enforcement collectively recognizes that there are clear legitimate purposes for milk water bottles. Uh, and, and I don't want there to be any confusion. Um, we did not take a position last night, nor do we take that we are there to arbitrarily take refreshments, medical supplies, um, needed personal items from people who are in the downtown area to peacefully gather. However, you have to appreciate and recognize the fact that as law enforcement professionals, uh, we are trusting the advice of subject matter expertise um, that is used to and trained to deal with civil unrest that is rapidly evolving in a violent manner. Um, you know, Again, it's, it's difficult to paint the picture of context, and I think many of our media partners on this, on this call recognize this was not where you had a small group on a corner that was breaking windows. Uh, at one point, this was upwards of 600 people in the downtown area. And of that 600 people, um, it, was, it was very difficult in the, very, in, the, in the beginning phases of the transition from protest to riot to get a handle around the number of riots that were involved. But this was a very fluid, very rapid, very evolving situation where block by block, we had numerous factions, splinter groups, individuals who were perpetrating violent crime against other individuals. Persons were being assaulted. Shots were being fired at random into large crowds, uh, causing panic and anxiety amongst the people that were in the downtown area. And so um, to get back specifically to the melt question, 
Um, we recognize the legitimate purpose, but at the same time, we have to recognize that sometimes legitimate instruments uh, are used for not so legitimate purposes. And that is what, uh, those are the points I was trying to get across with things like frozen water bottles, milk, uh, and other implements um, similar. Um, not everybody is going to have their, their property taken away from them and confiscated. Uh, I don't know that I agree with, with that version. Um, but we will remain cognizant of what those materials are and when we observe them being used uh, to further criminal activity, uh, we will absolutely move in and swiftly take action. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Um, in response to the question about uh, uh, Monday evening uh, after the, uh, uh, the expiration of uh, uh, tonight's uh, restrictions. Uh, we're going to take this on a case by uh, or day day by day uh, basis, uh, and uh, I, I I would say that as a uh, as a overarching matter uh, priority, uh, we will be making those uh, day to day decisions based on what is in the best interest of the public safety. Uh, and the public health of our community. And so uh, while uh, today's order uh, applies from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning, um, if, uh, if there's necessity to extend it, we will, uh, but we'll make, make those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Alyssa Raymond, WTHR. Alyssa, we will come back to you. Ryan Martin, Indianapolis Star. Uh, Chief Taylor, Deputy Chief Parker, could you tell us more about the two fatal shootings, such as anything about the circumstances of the shootings, what may have prompted them, what connection, if any, the shooting victims may have had to the groups of people downtown, and whether the shooting victims live downtown? Uh, I, I can share what I know um, with the understanding that these are both still very active investigations uh, and I cannot release information that would uh, not further our capability to investigate those thoroughly. Um, we did have two um, individuals killed in the downtown area last night. Um, I cannot speculate as to the relationships and some of those questions you're asking. Uh, our detectives are still very much digging through to get a full understanding of what those details actually are. Um, I can share with you that in one of those instances, uh, one of the investigations shortly after the um, shortly after the shooting took place, a suspect made themselves known to law enforcement and surrendered. Uh, our homicide detectives um, had the cooperation of several people that witnessed and were uh, involved in that incident. And in consultation with the Marion County Prosecutor's Office, an arrest was made on that individual last night. But I, I cannot give any more uh, details as to uh, those two investigations. Brianna Cooper, Indianapolis Recorder. Uh, good morning. My question is for Deputy Chief Barker. Um, going back to the incident at Market Street around 9 p.m., there were conflicting stories from the crowd, uh, many of whom said officers had them blocked in by the time they made it to Market Street, and that's when they began preparing for any measures that might have been taken. So just to clarify, you're saying that there were several minutes between the protesters arriving at the Market Street side of the city county building and IAPD arriving and taking action? Yes. Ebony Chappelle, Radio One. Okay, let's do Tom Davies from the Associated Press. Hello, um, what uh, what level of police response do you expect downtown uh, tonight? And has there been any significant uh, protest uh, damage or vandalism in other parts of the city in the last couple of months? Uh, 
our, our, our posture as far as staffing and officers being deployed will be very similar to last night. Uh, we will have uh, what we believe is the appropriate number of resources in the downtown area to maintain order, especially in light of the recent events of the curfew going into effect. Um, and, uh, with regards to unrest uh, on the perimeter of downtown throughout the rest of the city, uh, no reported instances uh, of large scale property damage or uh, unruly gatherings. Justin Mack, Indy Star. About the discussions uh, that took place between organizers and law enforcement before yesterday's demonstrations began. Talking to some organizers today, they said there was agreed upon time frame where police would be able to provide support and protection for the peaceful protests. Just for clarity, can you kind of restate what the agreement was between the organizers and police? What protection was supposed to be provided and what time frame protesters were allowed to be demonstrated in with the support of police? So those agreements were made from uh, four to seven. Uh, and I believe that was, uh, that was entered in good confidence, and I believe uh, uh, for the most part that worked out uh, well. Uh, we would be willing to, uh, to go down that path again if necessary. I, I do believe that the far majority of the people that were protesting uh, followed the, uh, uh, our request, and, uh, and we, of course, did our part to uh, make sure that they, they stayed safe. So um, I think that was a good relationship, a good agreement between uh, law enforcement was it communicated to protesters after seven what would take place? Um, was there anything clear that police would have complete purview to handle the situation? I guess post seven, uh, one of the organizers I talked to mentioned a march taking place from about seven to seven thirty, and didn't know if they were under any sort of protection at that time, or kind of what the agreement was when that time frame ended. Well, in all honesty, whenever they're down there, uh, we're going to provide protection where we can. Uh, the seven o'clock was. Uh, for uh, stop time for the groups that we spoke to. Uh, obviously, there's things that happened after that time. But our request was that uh, once seven o'clock came about, people would start dispersing and, and go back home, leave the downtown area. Uh, but we did not take a hard, aggressive approach um, uh, really within uh, you know minutes to hours after that seven o'clock. The thing that generated our response was uh, like uh, Chief Barker said, and like I've said before, is when we saw criminal acts occurring, then we had to take action. Cameron Riddle, Radio One. Hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, this question uh, for the mayor. Uh, Drejan Reed's mother, Dimitri Wynn, as well as members of Black Lives Matter, um, have said and, and the Black Lives Matter folks made it abundantly clear that they feel that uh, the mayor is misrepresenting the conversations that the mayor says that he had yesterday. Uh, Dimitri, when uh, Drejan's mother was on a, a, did a public address via Facebook Live um, saying that she was also being a bit misrepresented. So with that, both are asking for, uh, in order for, to satisfy what they're protesting is the release of information with Dre Jean Reed as far as the coroner's report and any other details that they're still waiting on. They say that's why they're going to continue to protest this week. And Ms. Wynn has given the, that endorsement to uh, Black Lives Matter to keep protesting while peacefully. So what does the city have planned as far as releasing information to the family and so that the protesters um, can feel as if they're being hurt. Well, let me uh, first begin by saying uh, everyone in the meeting yesterday made it clear that they wanted more information about the investigation. So uh, I, uh, I would take issue with uh, any kind of categorization that I've misrepresented, misrepresented anything. In fact, uh, they asked for information. Uh, I don't have that information. Uh, as mayor, I'm not part of the investigation. I explained that to them uh, in, in great detail. Uh, I think that there's just a misunderstanding about the process. Uh, if they want information uh, about the uh, investigation that is currently ongoing, uh, 
uh, they need to uh, address uh, the special prosecutor uh, and, and direct those questions to a special prosecutor once one uh, has been uh, named. Uh, there has been a delay in the naming uh, of the special prosecutor. I can't tell you why there's been a delay. I know that, that the delay is, I'm sure, frustrating uh, to the family uh, and to representatives of Black Lives Matter. Uh, but again, um, the, the mayor's role in uh, that, that, that investigation uh, is almost non-existent. Uh, I don't participate in any way, shape, or form. And I uh, explained that to all the members uh, who were present at that meeting in great detail uh, to the extent that they think that the mayor still can do anything the mayor wants. Uh, I would simply reiterate that my role is well-defined and it is in essence non-existent as it relates to participating in the investigation uh, surrounding uh, the police action shooting involved at uh, 62nd Division. And are our last question will be from Elizabeth from the Indy Star. Hi, can you talk about how you'll enforce the curfew tonight? Um, what officers will do when they encounter someone who's out past curfew? Uh, yes, uh, with, with the curfew being instituted, um, we will still take, um, if I say reactive approach, we will have, again, the appropriate numbers of officers in the downtown area, which is where we will start our initial focus. Uh, once the curfew is put into effect, um, we will give uh, we will give citizens ample time to safely move out of the downtown area, uh, and our messaging to officers will be to make sure that we are giving um, the appropriate number of announcements and engaging with people before we just do some sort of blind uh, enforcement or curfew sweep. Um, our intention is to have a dialogue and engage with these folks. Um, in a peaceful manner so that we can have those collaborative discussions so that we can make them understand the purpose of the curfew, give them an ample opportunity to vacate the area, uh, and then we will utilize the enforcement tactic uh, as a last resort for those individuals who are detained. That concludes today's press conference. Thank you for joining